Hi guys, I'm Sean, and I'm here to talk to you about not designing for apps at the App Design Series. So if you want to leave after just 30 seconds, this is in essence what I'm going to say. Intro, apps aren't dead, but it's time to transcend them. And then give you a few tips, success principles. There's probably a lot of others out there, but a few that I've stumbled across about how to actually design for this new world that's more or less post-app and post-screen, and then a little bit of Q&A. So to start with, just really quickly, who I am. I've, you know, I'm a designer. I've been in the business for you know, about 15 years out here on the West Coast. I went to the Berkeley High School for a master's degree, and I studied uh, the basic information school technology, you know, technology, um, design, uh, user research, those sorts of things, and the way people like, classify things. But I also study a lot of uh, like architecture and urban planning. I took some classes over at the other side of campus where people think about design in a very different way. And that'll fit into some of this. And just some of the folks I've worked with, Frog, Jawbone, Intel, Adaptive Path, a bunch of other folks. I've been a freelancer for the most part through my career. Um, and that's who I am. So for most of my career, I did design. You know, I did a lot of app design as well as kiosks and you know, web. So I'm not completely anti-app. Um, but I've also done other stuff too. So for instance, this is kind of an Internet of Things thing. It's something that looks, to visitors, they don't really know what it is. It just looks like art or something weird. But for the people who live in the house and they're familiar with what it means, which is embedded in this thing, it'll tell you as you're walking out the door, what is the next bus to, if you're trying to go downtown, which bus or train to go to, if you're trying to go to the beach, wherever you're trying to go. Just by a glance at that, you know what it is. It's thinking about how to get away from pulling out your smartphone. Okay. So anyway, that's just getting from what I am to what I'm trying to tell you. In short, apps aren't dead. Um, their growth is starting to slow down a little bit, but the world is filled with people looking at their smartphones, stumbling down the street, walking into things, and so on. Um, and as you can see here, the figures show that they're not going away anytime soon. This is uh, the app share of digital media time spent, and it's still continuing to go up at a pretty remarkable rate, right? So, you know, on the one hand, it's good that we're having an app design series because they're still important, but it's time to start thinking about the future a little bit. You know, it's sticking around, the smartphone is, especially for things like, you know, finding re good restaurants nearby. There's going to be something like that that you'll be holding probably for a long time that will be doing things like that. But more and more, you're seeing it used to actually augment, to augment other services that are actually embedded in the environment, or services like car pickup services, or food delivery, or um, you know, fitness bands. And so it's just one window, like an app and a smartphone, is you can look at as just one window and one facet into and out of these services, which which are going across many other uh, things. So it's time to transcend these apps and start thinking beyond that. So this is another, you know, this shows basically that at the top you see um, that the mobile apps are still continuing to grow, but they're really starting to shrink down. And especially if you plot it, if you look at uh, the growth rate, it's really drastically starting to um, shrink down. And that's actually the real figures. If you start to look at what people are prognosticating, um, what does this look like to you? To me, it looks a lot like the mobile first days when Luke Robluski was talking about, look at these numbers with, uh, and the projections with we're going from desktop to mobile. And you know, desktop is still there, but it's kind of shrinking off. That's really starting to happen now with mobile phones, but you're starting to see these Internet of Things devices really start to take off. And that's especially true in certain parts of the world, um, you know, especially Western Europe and Asia. But in general, that trend is following. Like, for instance, in Western Europe, they've declared, in the EU, they've declared that it's the law now. It's going to be the law that all the cars, all new cars are going to have to be networked. They're going to have to have some of this Internet of Things technology embedded in them. So it's not even an option. And what does this mean for us? We really have, again, thinking beyond smartphones, we have these three big superpowers for, as designers that these technological trends are giving us. Um, well, I'm sorry, actually the three classes of them are Internet of Things, wearables, and um, augmented reality. But it gives us two superpowers, which is outputs and inputs. Where we can paint the world with information. And in a way, you, these three things are kind of the same. In a certain way, as a designer, you can look at these three trends as building the same thing. If you're looking at something through augmented realities, you know, glasses or spectacles, 
or if there's something actually embedded in the room that's showing the same thing, it's kind of, as it, from a designer's perspective, you can think of it the same way. And the same thing with uh, Internet of Things, when you think about drones and uh, a whole host of other new technologies that are coming out, it really allows you, it gives you new ways to paint the world with information and to draw information in. And so to move on to just success principles, some ways to think about this in terms of what concretely can we do and what thematically, how can we approach and actually view our design work to, to succeed in this world. The biggest thing is to really look beyond the tech industry. Like I said, architecture and urban planning in particular, in the digital design realm, we have kind of a history that goes back to the 60s, maybe the late 50s, when there was this thing called a computer. And it was something that filled a whole building, like a whole huge room at MIT or something. And people would compete in academics, only a few, a vaunted few uh, of the nobility class of computer engineers were allowed to use them. And they would argue and fight with each other for the ability to have a few minutes to go up to this machine and feed punch cards to it and then wait for the results. And that's kind of built around from the start in our DNA as digital designers. That's a tradition that starts starting from building for a machine. Um, but with architecture and urban planning, this is traditions that go back for thousands and thousands of years that by definition, they have to start, if you're building something in the city, you have to start by thinking about what is around the thing that you're gonna build, not the thing that you're gonna build, right? So you have to start to think about context. Who's it for? Whose lives is it gonna change? What are the spaces and places and flows in the city that it's gonna interrupt? And the same thing with fashion and music in these other realms. More folks need to come, be pulled into the tent here. So I think it really makes a lot of sense to hire people who come from dif different design traditions and different traditions outside of design if we're really going to make the world work with this stuff. Um, another thing is to harmonize, don't replace, right? This was a joke from The Daily Show, but it doesn't look that different from what Google Glass ended up doing, right? It was making fun of Google Glass, and that's kind of was a flop because you know, sometimes we do fail to talk to folks outside of our little narrow design tradition and tech tradition. So, but you see some of these smarter new things that are, are bringing in some of the fashion world and artists. And, uh, but more importantly, thinking about what are people looking around you and what are people in the city or in the country or anywhere doing right now? What are their current behaviors? What do they like to wear? What do they like to do? And start to build out, build, starting with that, instead of building with this new gadget and pushing that into somebody's life and say, you know, you have to fit this into your life somehow and shoehorn it. Because then you end up with this and people just make fun of you and people, you know, don't buy your stuff. So that's not what we want. So another thing is to harness context. Again, this all ties together. Again, it's that kind of architecture and urban planning tradition. You start with context. You don't start with your tool. You start with the people who it's going to affect. And the other things that already exist that it's going to affect. This was a great example, I think. Um, Alfred Louis came up with this concept of a weather display. This is a very simple, like just like an iPad screen, a little screen that you can, uh, or an Arduino screen that you can buy for pretty cheap and put a weather display, right? Next to the door on the way out. But as you're, he simply has a PIR, like a $2 motion sensor that you can attach to your device. And it detects proximity, right? We've all seen this used before, but in this case, the display adjusts the amount of information and how interruptive it is, too, based on how close you are to it. If you're walking right up to something, obviously, it, it can infer that you're showing interest. Or in this case, maybe as you're walking out the front door, it makes sense for you to know more about the weather. And I think this is just one little idea that's very concrete that we could apply across a whole host of things that we do. Just simply displays that are out in the world, have them detect proximity. And so, this display, you know, when you walk into a restaurant and there's TVs all over the place that are flashing and blaring with commercials and things without people watching them, what if they simply faded out a little bit and weren't so interruptive until you came up to them and showed um, interest? Or the same thing in, you know, in airports, you know, subway stations, just simply detecting the proximity of somebody. And then there's all kinds of other things you can detect too. And what this means is the user doesn't have to pull out, again, your smartphone and manually tell the system, here's what I want. I want to know more about the weather. Instead, you can just walk by and have it happen. Context. And this is the same, th this is thinking beyond the things, right? Again, build for humans, for people, for patterns, for societies, for groups. Um, don't build starting with, a, with an object. 
because this is so important right now because we have this whole with the smartphone and with the desktops, everybody had pretty much one smartphone and desktop. But now we have a whole waterfall of all these little devices. And if they're all going to be rude and demand our attention, and they're going to be designed around them instead of us, it's going to make life hell for everybody. So please design these things around the people. This is maybe the dark side of that. An example, you see what's going on there? This is a tattoo. And it has a display as well as uh, storage inside it. The display can tell the person uh, information about their, uh, you know, their health, as well as other information that you can um, have the, the network communicate through it. It can also be used for authentication, like so for payments, you wouldn't have to carry your phone with you, or to get into, you know, into the um, rooms in your office, you can just, uh, you know, use actually your hand for that. Of course, that introduces new risks too, and we really have to be careful in thinking about. And I think looking at fictional, you know, like Dark Mirror and some of these science fiction things, it's important to think about the potential futures where these things could take us. There's obvious advantages with this stuff when you're having things embedded in your body and when you're having things embedded in your environment through installations as well as through uh, wearables. Um, but there's disadvantages too. And this is a huge one too. One of my favorite essays that I've read in the past 10 years having to do with design is this one right here. It's written by Brett Victor, who is, um, who is a high-end uh, Apple designer, and he left Apple. But one of the things that he kind of rebelled against at Apple is the concept that the religion of the flat smart screen and the lack of tactile behavior, the motion that you make with your hand sliding across a flat surface, that's a pretty rare and unnatural motion in terms of out in the world. Um, there's all these other things we do. Our hands, you know, we're humans. We're the animal that um, is the tool maker and the tool user. And our hands reflect that. They're very complicated, very beautiful um, pieces of machine, machinery that actually can detect things as well as manipulate things in all kinds of sorts of ways. But our digital tech is still having us, for the most part, just do this thing, which is you, you can't feel any sort of feedback from, uh, except visually, you have to look down and walk into a telephone pole because the you know, um, the device is not actually giving you any feedback. And yeah, so just start to think about all these other things the hand can do. And with these new types of devices going beyond the smartphones, we can really harness that. And I think the last and the most important thing, it's really important to strive for calm and for kind of politeness from these devices, making sure that they fit into our lives. This was a great example, I think, um, of this sort of thing, of taking the cognitive load off the person and putting it into the device, or using the parts of the body, the hands, or uh, you know, haptic uh, feedback. What this thing does is it's very simple. It's, um, there's a series of vibration motors around this belt. One of them, long story short, is always buzzing. And the one that's always buzzing is the one that's pointing north. When people wear this thing, for the first couple hours or so, they notice it. You know, They notice the thing buzzing but you start to kind of ignore it. And you just kind of have this sixth sense of which way is north. And people report that they have, they're better at wandering around. They don't get lost as often. Now imagine, you know, obviously using this sort of technology for, uh, you know, in the Apple Watch has messed with this a little bit, but not that successfully, I think. But telling people directions without having to look visually at something, but it tells you when to turn based on touch. We have all these nerve endings all over our body that for the most part that aren't used. And again, Visual, you know, vision re takes full attention. It takes a lot of attention. Um, and people tend to get worked up if they have to pay attention to too many things. But if you can use these other routes that are more calm and they become a little bit less, uh, they require less attention, that's a great way to accomplish that. So that's it.